Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can get access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. Before we dive into today's episode, I have a few exciting updates to share. As some of you may know, I was recently a guest on Joe Rogan's podcast. We spoke for over three hours about a whole range of topics, so I really recommend you check that out on Spotify and uh, let me know what you think. And in other news, members of the podcast got to hear my latest single called Straight A's last week. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, it's now available on all music streaming platforms for the public. So check that out. It's called Straight A's. And the music video for that will be coming out in early March. And that'll be available first to members and then to the world. As always, if you want to get early access to my podcasts and my music, you can sign up at colemanhughes.org. Now on to the episode. My guest today is Matt Taibbi. Matt is a writer, journalist, and podcaster. He's a contributing editor at Rolling Stone and co-host of the Useful Idiots podcast. He won the National Magazine Award in 2008 and is the author of many books, including The Great Derangement, Griftopia, and Hate, Inc. In this episode, Matt and I talk about the Substack revolution. We talk about paternalism in public health messaging. We talk about why Trump won in 2016. We talk about the perception that people like Matt and myself are right wing. We talk about censorship from big tech. We talk about book bans in public schools. We discuss whether COVID-19 leaked from a lab and much more. So without further ado, Matt Taibbi. All right, Matt Taibbi. Thanks so much for coming on my show. Thank you so much for having me on. It's an honor. Yeah, I've, I've been wanting to have you on for a long time. I've been reading your Substack with great pleasure, and I think a lot of my, uh, my audience have as well. And there's a lot of topics of mutual interest, I think. But you know, one topic of personal interest to me is your very strange and interesting life trajectory that <laughs> includes, correct me if I'm wrong, being a basketball player in Mongolia. And so, I mean, it sounds extremely strange and interesting. And I want to know how you got from where you were born to there to here in a nutshell. Sure. Um, so I was the, uh, I was born in New Jersey. My uh, parents were both Rutgers students. They were very young. Uh, well, what 20. town in New Jersey? Just uh, New Brunswick. New Brunswick. Okay. Yeah. And um, my father was a reporter. He, uh, he worked at the home news when he was a student and then he was a TV reporter from a very young age, uh, around 22 or so. So um, we moved to New England. He worked at a local affiliate there and I never wanted to be a journalist growing up. I um, well, fell in love with novelists, especially funny novelists. And that's really what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, and um, went through school. I had a bit of a tough childhood okay. for which, writing. Which, uh, which funny novelists? There were some people on Twitter that were interested in, in who specifically you were into. So I, uh, my favorite writer growing up, is someone who's kind of obscure in the United States, but he's a Russian writer named Nikolai Gogol. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Dead Souls, which is a, one of the great epic comedies of all time. Um, interestingly enough, it's about financial corruption. So mm. I ended up writing about some of that stuff myself, but um, not as fiction. Um, I love, you know, any satirical novels. So like Evil and Wah, uh, you know, Gulliver's Travels, Catch-22, um, Books, books like that. Uh, there were a lot of Russian writers that I was really interested in, which is why I ended up studying in Russia um, when I was a college student. I went over and wanted to learn the language so that I could read these books in Russian. And then when I graduated, um, you know, I had a sort of a carpe diem attitude as a as a young person. I thought uh, 
there, Soldier Meetsman once said, there's nothing more boring than a man with a career. So I, uh, I wasn't really interested in, uh, as a young person in, um, you know, sort of building up through the ranks or having a journalism career or doing any of that. I, I saw it as a means to an end to, to do interesting things with my life. Um, I started being a bit of a foreign correspondent, but that was just to pay the bills overseas. And I spent really about 12 years traveling in the former Soviet Union, places like Mongolia, Uzbekistan. I, I just had a lot of weird experiences. Um, my attitude was that I would learn a lot about life. I'd learn a foreign language and, um, and I wouldn't regret wasting my twenties in a cubicle, you know? So I did stuff like played for pro baseball in, uh, in, in Moscow. Uh, I played basketball in Mongolia. I worked in a monastery, uh, laid bricks in Siberia. I did all kinds of stuff like that. And, um, that was sort of the, ended up being like the foundation, you know, for, a journalism career because um, I used the journalism as a way to to have a lot of those experiences. I would tell people that I was doing an article, and I, and I would I would write the article eventually. But really, it was it was just a, to have an interesting time. So, how did your adventures in Russia, Mongolia, and and elsewhere inform your personality or your perspectives as a writer and journalist today? Well, I think. I think one of the things when you spend a lot of time outside the United States, you realize how insular um, reporters are in America. They have very little sense of how the rest of the world works. You see things in a more jaded way. Maybe when you return home, um, you know, in Russia, the corruption was so transparent. You could just so easily see which gangster was supporting which politician and, uh, you know, each one owned his or her, I mean, his own newspaper. So you would wake up in the morning and say, well, this, this mob interest wants me to think this, and this mob interest wants me to think that. And then when you come home to the United States, you realize it's not so different. It's just a little bit more, it looks a little more, more superficially respectable. So I, I think I just learned a lot about how the world works, you know, going to different parts of the world and, um, you know, seeing how politics operates in different places uh, and not thinking America was so very special or different than other places. It's just the scale here is much bigger uh, than it is anywhere else. So it made you more cynical about the American media and political landscape rather than less? I think so. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I think cynical is, is an odd word because it implies you know, a lack of idealism, which I don't think is actually the case. I'm actually quite idealistic and optimistic generally. Um, but I, I did, I did have a way And when, when I came home, I did see, um, the United States in a different light than I think a lot of my colleagues did, especially when I started covering like presidential elections and things like that. There were most of the people who were, you know, quote unquote on the bus, they were, they were so enthralled and impressed with the process of, you know, getting somebody elected. And to me, it's, it was much more mundane. It was always, well, this person's getting money from these banks and these oil companies and they, that's their candidate. And this person isn't in that way. That's why this person isn't going to win. And um, I think that's, that's how you have to, to, to look at politics is, is not be so impressed by, uh, the superficialities of things, but just, you know, look at how things actually work. So you're one of uh, many writers that, that I enjoy that have moved to Substack. And, you know, Substack has created this platform where they can really credibly say, we don't censor people. We don't bend to pressure. They are, we are politically neutral and they've stepped into that brand and done it in, in a really credible way where Substack as a platform almost seems invisible and just like a neutral medium uh, through which to deliver to your inbox writers that you like and to allow you to have a direct relationship to your patrons pretty much. And I think it's, it's, it's done a really excellent thing. And there's so many um, uh, other people that I, I love on that platform. At the same time, it's come under a lot of criticism for not being, um, 
for having no filter on, on its content, for being uh, the midwife to lots of misinformation about COVID and other things. Um, and then, you know, it's come under a different line of critique, which is that, you know, for people who like the Substack ecosystem, well, this is great, but are we really influencing the mainstream conversation by sort of running and hiding in this cloistered Substack world? So I guess my question is, A, why do you think Substack has seen such a boom? What what is failing in media that's creating that demand? And B, what are the sort of promises and limits of the Substack explosion? That's a really good question. I think the reason it's, it's succeeding, I think we both have a good idea of why that is. Uh, the traditional corporate media got to be basically unwatchable, you know, in recent years. It's just totally predictable. You know, if you turn on an MSNBC um, or Fox, it doesn't really matter. You, you know, either one of those channels, when you, if you turn them on, you know, a hundred percent of the time in advance what they're going to say about every topic. Uh, and, you know, for me personally, I didn't exactly have that experience because I worked at Rolling Stone, which was, um, you know, where I had a good relationship with editors and they gave me significant freedom to explore basically anything I wanted to. But uh, still, if you were in that kind of center left ecosystem, there were increasingly certain pieties that you could not cross. Um, you had to have you know, certain mandatory opinions about things. And I think that turns off readers. They don't, they don't like that. They like to be treated like grownups. They like to be given the information and left to their own devices to decide what to do with it. And I think increasingly in, in corporate media, what, what the attitude is, is we are going to tell you not only what the information is, but we're going to filter out the stuff that we think isn't good for you. And we're going to tell you what to think. And people really don't like that. They, they don't respond well to that um, sort of hubristic approach to, to rhetoric. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, you know, a show like Joe Rogan's does well. I think it's just because it's not so much his delivery. It's, it's this attitude of, you know, humility toward the audience that, well, I'll talk to this person. I'll talk to that person. We'll just talk, I'll sort it out together. It's more relaxing for people. So I think that's, that's part of what the success is. And, you know, as somebody who has worked in media for almost, well, well, for 30 years now uh, and watched it uh, progressively decline financially throughout that entire time to be in Substack where the opposite is happening is such a shock. I've never seen this before in media. Um, so it's the, the audiences are, are really big. The limitations, though, are, are pretty obvious. I think the problem with Substack is that it depends upon generating a lot of content and it doesn't give you um, a lot of time to do like what I used to do, for instance. Like I, I, they would, Rolling Stone, they would assign me to cover some financial topic and I would have eight weeks um, to do the investigation and then write it up and do all the fact checking and do all that stuff. Um, you can't do that on Substack. We just haven't figured out a way to, to monetize um, hardcore investigative reporting yet. I think that's, that's kind of a limitation, but what, but people are getting <clears throat> a wide array of opinions at least um, and, and some journalism uh, and that is, you know, sort of outside the mainstream and, and they like it. And I think that's a good thing. If you're someone like me who's constantly bombarded with news from a digital landscape you just can't seem to trust, Ground News is for you. For every breaking news story, they'll show you which media outlets are reporting on the issue and where they fall on the political spectrum. So you can instantly spot media bias. You can discover stories outside of your echo chamber and get some clarity in this increasingly chaotic world. The Ground News website and app lets you compare headlines from the left, center, and right with a simple swipe and their blind spot feed will show you stories that are not being reported by one side of the political spectrum. Subscribers can also gain access to features like My News Bias, which lets you track your own reading habits so you can see how factual your sources are, who owns those sources, and much more. 
Ground news isn't better news, but it is a better way to consume news. Get all of your news in one place. Download the Ground News app or install the browser extension to make sure you're seeing the full picture. Visit www.ground.news Coleman today to demand more from your news. Yeah. So speaking of this problem of treating people like children, this is also something I've noticed in the public health messaging during COVID. And there is this, I think, real philosophical difference about what public health mes- messaging should do. Should it be totally honest and transparent? Should it treat the population as more or less smart, capable of handling facts and nuance, capable of not jumping to false conclusions from true facts? or should public health messaging be paternalistic? Should it be that, um, you know, Fauci, Francis Collins, well, now, um, no longer Francis Collins, but the public health officials should act sort of like our parents. Well, that's key. Mm-hmm. And they should, um, you know, manage and massage the truth in ways that are going to lead to, to the best outcomes. And, you know, Fauci has openly admitted to, massaging the the truth about what number of people we need uh, to get vaccinated to reach herd immunity. And he's basically said, you know, like I've, I've been moving the numbers based on where I think the population (laughs) is at, not based on what the scientific truth is. Um, So, I mean, but like, let's treat this philosophical difference as a real difference, right? Uh, What is your philosophy of public health messaging and why do you think it's, you know, where do you weigh in on that debate? Why do you think your take is, is, is correct? Well, I, I don't know about public health messaging specifically. I just think mm-hmm. in terms of reaching audiences, uh, my experience is always that if you treat audiences as grownups, that they respond better. Also, people in media and in politics, they tend to underestimate uh, the general public uh, to an enormous degree, like just to take an example from my own experience, um, you know, I was asked to cover the 2008 financial crisis uh, after the election that year. And I was repeatedly told by people in financial media, well, you can't get into the weeds on this stuff. Like you can't tell people what, you know, spend 2000 words or 3000 words on what a credit default swap is and how that works, because people are stupid and they'll tune it out and they won't want to uh, read forward on that. And it just turns out to be exactly the opposite. People actually have a tremendous hunger to be, have things explained to them and they want to be able to make informed decisions about what's going on. And if you lie to them, even once the game is over from that point, like they are never going to listen to you again. And so I think what we've seen with COVID, and you brought up a couple of the examples, but there have been so many of these instances where they, I, I, the superficial explanation is that they're for our own good. They're trying to either exclude facts or downplay facts in an effort to try to get people to make the decision to get vaccinated. Just to take an example, downplaying the effectiveness of natural immunity, right? Like, why would you do that? Why, why would you tell people that, well, actually, it doesn't really work or we, we recommend our, you know, our, our, our uh, assessment is that uh, vaccination is more effective. Why can't you just say to people, look, natural immunity does work, but we also think that you should get vaccinated. Like, that's a smart thing to do. Um, and, we, and furthermore, uh, as a society wide strategy, it works better for everybody if you get vaccinated. But if you if you happen to have already had the disease, um, you will be you know protected from it to a certain degree. And let's tell you exactly what that is. I don't understand why they can't do that. And they've taken the attitude from the beginning. I don't know what you think about this, that people can't handle uh, those kinds of distinctions. And I think it's been catastrophic. I don't I don't know about you, but to, to my mind, there's probably going to be always a certain number of people who, who will turn it tune out the government. Um, but they've increased that number, I think, by their uh, posture. Yeah. So I think my guess is that intelligence, the intelligence of the population is sort of the wrong metric to be looking at here. Uh, but the 
the conformism of the population is the right metric. Like there are, whether you're a conformist or not is sort of an element of your personality. I don't know if it's part genetic, part, part environmental or whatever, but you have people that are just more likely to do what the crowd is doing and to trust uh, the common wisdom. And you have people that are less likely to do that. And I think more conformist people end up at more conformist institutions. And I think they assume that, you know, more people are like them in the world than actually are. That's a good point. I think they think, you know, like if we just say that her, uh, that, that natural immunity doesn't work, if we basically call any, any concern about myocarditis misinformation, we, we, rather than give, you know, like the nuanced take of, you know, natural immunity uh, is, is, is good too, but we still recommend you get vaxxed or there is an increased risk of myocarditis for, you know, boys aged you know, 18, men aged 18 to 24, but it's actually still, you know, very, very safe despite even the, even the, the, the worst estimates suggest you should probably still get the vaccine um, in most cases. And that doesn't generalize to people outside of that population, right? So people think that people underestimate the number of nonconformists and um, and I think they therefore underestimate the the deleterious effect to their own reputation by telling these sort of quote unquote white lies. Mm-hmm. I think they assume most people are just going to look at the headline, not along and and do this. And a lot of people do. Um, but a lot of people don't. And I think they're just sort of not around those people. And so they underestimate the, the effect on their own reputation. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I never really thought of it that way. But yeah, that's that's probably what's going on is that they're, the people who are doing this messaging assume that people, everybody out there thinks the way they do. And um, they're wrong about that, you know, there's, there, but you would have to have some kind of experience talking to people generally in order to know that. And that's another one of the problems with the kind of elite messaging system in the, in this country, which is that there isn't a whole lot of interplay between people in Washington and New York, you know, sort of elite decision makers in all fields in politics, finance, whatever, and the rest of the country. And I, I, I've seen this over and over again in presidential politics, you know, how does something like Trump happen? How does, how does every single, uh, you know, mainstream news outlet not only miscall the general election, but miscall the Republican uh, primary. I mean, you had, you had data journalists like 538.com saying things like Donald Trump will play in the NBA before he's the nominee of the Republican Party, you know, at a time when he was wiping everybody out in the polls. And the reason for that is because, uh, you know, most of these people had never met somebody who who supported Donald Trump. Right. So if you actually went out in the trail and you talked to people or you went to some of those crowds and I remember being shocked by it, I thought I thought Trump, there was no way this this guy could possibly win. Uh, He's he's ridiculous uh, and kind of horrible. And, And then I went. I went to these, you know, events and I saw, well, he's connecting with all sorts of people and he, he was doing all sorts of subtle things um, that I was not told about in the, new, in the news media. Uh, and they were working as well. And um, and so when you start talking to people, you start realizing there's this diverse range of, of reasons that people were, were coming to vote for this person. Um, but you would have to you would have to have those conversations in order to know that. And, and they're not that's not what's going on. They're relying too much on things like polls to make decisions as opposed to personal contact. The same thing happened after, again, after the 2008 crash. I remember talking to somebody in the Treasury um, who had just had a, um, a meeting uh, before. I think it was before Christmas in in the first year of Obama's presidency. And it was a presentation by some of the the nation's biggest retailers to officials at the treasury. And they were giving their estimates of how little people were going to spend for the holiday season. Uh, And that was how people in the treasury learned that there was a lot of pain out there in the population, that people were not doing well after, 
after the 2008 crash from a presentation by big corporate retailers. Like they, they didn't know anybody who wasn't doing well, you know, and that's, that's a real problem with information in this country is the sort of lack of interplay between those groups. Yeah. And there's also, I mean, I, I would admit to being as clueless and cloistered a quote elite bubble kind of person when Trump got elected as anyone and that I was as surprised as the people at 530 in the New York times. And I knew as few people that would have voted for Trump but it seemed to me a lot of a lot of people like me. The reaction was, "Wow, my mo-, it, it it was like my model of the country was totally flawed." Obviously, given that I totally mispredicted what happened, and the way it was wrong is that there's actually way more racist than I thought. Somehow, in the same country that just elected Obama twice, there's been like a random, recent huge spike in racism. And that's the most important explanation for, for this. Whereas my response was like, clearly my model of the country is wrong. My model of what's going on is missing some crucial variables. But it can't be that the same country that just elected you know, Barack Hussein Obama twice suddenly had a massive upswing in racism that explains this. It has to be um, certain other factors. And I think there was a huge, uh, a lot of people weren't willing to do that. Yeah. And, and especially since the data didn't really bear that out, like um, uh, Trump did very well in a lot of the parts of the country, the, the same parts of the country that Obama did. Like Ob- Obama was one of the first Democrats who retook the so-called Reagan Democrats in places, you know, like suburban Detroit, you know, where the union workers, auto workers had long ago defected to the Republican Party. Or, um Obama did really well in a lot of those places that had been lost to Democrats for a long time. And, and Trump did well with those same voters. Uh, I talked to a lot of those people. Look, a race was clearly a, a major factor in Trump's rise. But there were so many other things that were going on. Um, and a lot of it had to do with just this class issue, this hatred of um, sort of the the corporate press, the the two political parties, um, and Trump represented this 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 figure who came out and said, "Look, they they have been lying to you. There's not a whole lot of difference between Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. They're supported by the same people. You think Jeb Bush is going to give you cheaper pharmaceutical prices? Look, his campaign finance chair is Woody Johnson, right? Who's the head of Johnson and Johnson? I mean, you know." this guy's not going to do it for you. And that message really worked. He also really clicked with veterans who had come back from uh, the Middle East. I started to see a lot of, a lot of vets at his appearances over the course of that campaign, because he would, he was talking about NATO. He, um, he wasn't exactly, you know, anti-war because he said things like I'm great at war. And he suggested that uh, he was going to be a, uh, terrific at that, but he talked about the uselessness of a lot of our foreign conflicts and, and he was scoring points with that stuff. Right. And especially when he said things like, you know, both parties supported it. Uh, and yeah, so there were a lot of factors, but I think there was a concerted effort on the part of people in the mainstream press to say, this can't be happening. It has to be some simple expl- explanation and we can just put it, you know, put a bow on it and put it over there and never think about it again. Whereas the, the implications of, of Trump's win were actually a lot more disturbing um, than they, you know, to, to those people than they wanted to admit. Uh, and they, they still haven't done it. I don't think. So there's this perception that people like you and, and Glenn, Glenn Greenwald have moved to the right. Um, and that's, uh, you know, partly the result of you being, I think you and Glenn actually being, um, uh, you know, sort of calling the the Russia, you know, Trump is a Russia Russian asset story out as BS uh, from the beginning, and 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 certain other topics that would lead right wing audience to to like you probably, if not for the first time, then certainly more than they would have five ten years ago. Have you moved to the right? You know, and and if so, um, you know, people blame this on the so-called audience capture phenomenon. 
you know, can you speak to that? Because that's an, that's an impression that's out there about you. Yeah, I know. And it's troubling. And I see that on Twitter all the time. You know, I, I, my answer to that is no. Um, my views really on everything have remained exactly the same. I think uh, I've always been very much against censorship, very much a free speech advocate. Uh, I'm basically kind of an old school ACLU liberal. I mean, that's that's you know, my, my politics really haven't changed since I was a teenager. Uh, and that's really on all issues. Um, I, I think what's happened is that the consensus on a lot of those issues has, has shifted dramatically. Um, so we now have this sort of center left belief that deplatforming works, that we have to do something on misinformation. So there's this deep, profound mistrust of the principles of free speech. Uh, you see the shift at the ACLU, right? The, so where the the Ira Glasser types who would have defend, who defended the Nazis in the 70s, um, you know, they now think very, very dramatically differently about that. Um, they probably wouldn't make that decision now. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I haven't changed at all. I think what's happened is um, I've just kind of stuck to what, to what I do believe. Um, and that just happens to be, uh, unpopular now. There's also a, a, uh, a propaganda technique that I, I find really tiresome. I'm, I don't know if you've encountered this yourself. I think you have, I've, I've seen this on Twitter yeah. where, you know, anytime anybody wants to criticize some figure who has an opinion that's a little bit different, the, you know, the go-to response is, oh, well, that's right wing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, you know, it's not. It's much more reality is much more complicated. Like, oh, but that's a right wing talking point. It's like, oh, yeah. OK, but could you concede that a right wing talking point could be true? Well, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And, yeah, and possible. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to, to take the example of that Russia story that you brought up, mm -hmm. um, again, I, I had spent a long time in Russia. I was there for you know, almost 12 years of my life. And, um, I had, um, a lot of contacts who were in still in the Russian press. I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to that story early on. I thought it was silly. Uh, so it didn't really make, um, a big impression on me, but when, when I finally did start to write about it, it wasn't from the posture of, Oh, I'm a conservative. Now I support Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, is this story true or not? And, and it didn't seem to be true. And I was kind of shocked by the reaction that, oh, well, if you, if you are saying that the story is not true, that must mean that you, you support Trump, which to me was just completely inconsistent logically. It also showed, you, showed me a lot about where the press's head was at at that time. Because at one time, the, you know, again, I grew up in a family of reporters, um, the dominant thinking about how to do the job was, we didn't really care all that much. We just wanted to get it right. Uh, the job is hard enough if you're trying to just be accurate. Um, whether or not information helps or hurts a certain political party, that's really more the, the audience's problem. It's not really our problem. Our, our job is just to tell you what we see and uh, which way that, that information cuts is not really you know, a matter for the press to worry about. But now they very much think it is. And I, that's a new thing, I think. I think that's part of what's going on. There's a, there's a great quote by Thomas Sowell, who's one of my favorite writers, who said you know, on the topic of racial, and, uh, racial equality, if you believed in equal treatment for blacks and whites, you'd be, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you'd be a radical in 1950, uh, you know, a liberal in 1970 and, and a conservative today, right? Right. Whereas like you can, you know, the notion that race should have no place in how New York State Department of Health prioritizes who should get antivirals for COVID, right? Like that, that's my position. And I, it's squarely in the civil rights tradition of, you know, race is not the, the a proxy for anything crucial. We have better proxies for your need for COVID antivirals and it's discriminatory full stop in principle to inject it, right? That belief, if that puts me on the quote unquote right, 
then I don't, I don't on that particular issue, I don't care because I, I have to, you have to be a person of principle, right? Like a party is not a principle. So insofar as you have principles, and I talked to Glenn Greenwald about this, you, you're very likely over your lifetime to find yourself in any given moment, you know, aligned with one or the other party on a particular issue because neither of the parties are consistent in principle, right? So by definition, if you are consistent in principle, you're going, you're going to be, um, you know, you're going to be on either side on, on any given issue. So, um, I mean, that's definitely the way I see it. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't see it that way, but that's yeah, and is. they're incredibly narrow-minded about that. And, you know, I think that example you brought up is a really powerful and interesting one. I mean, uh, not that long ago, in 2017, that was just five years ago, I published uh, a book about uh, Eric Garner's uh, killing. You know, I can't breathe. And in the course of that research for that book, I met lawyers who had risked their lives um, to uh, fight cases for the ACLU back in the early 70s in an effort to get race out of the law. Right. Like they they had done, been involved with cases that were they were essentially like school um, segregation, desegregation cases in Arkansas and every day had dealt with death threats had had things thrown at them. One of them had, you know, had had, had a brick thrown at him. And to, I, I remember being inspired by these stories, thinking that, that, that this was heroic. Like that's what, that's what a, a, a person of conscience does. Um, and now all of a sudden, I'm, you know, not, not long ago, I was covering a story in Loudoun County, Virginia, where there's an effort now to basically to reintroduce the idea of, Let's overtly put race into um, into the, the you know the school's method for uh, choosing admissions to gifted programs, uh, you know, on the basis of this new, sort of new equity ideas. So again, what what they would have thought in 1972 or 1973 would have, would have been sort of radically left or radically liberal or however you would have thought. Um, maybe not radically at that time already, but it would have been certainly squarely on that side. Now, all of a sudden it's considered, um, the opposite. And, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think that, uh, that's right wing to stick to that principle of believing in, for instance, race neutral law. Um, but you know, we'll see how that pans out. You're successful in business because you love doing the research, whether it's the state of the market or the next hire. But when you're low on hours and you still want to do a great job, who do you go to for help? It's time for Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed partners with you on every step of the hiring process. Find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match Assessments and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. Indeed helps star applicants shine with over 135 assessment tests from cooking to coding. Indeed assessments help take the stress out of the interview process. Your candidates don't need to prove themselves again and again, and you can dive deeper into talking about what's important to you. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash conversations. Offer is valid through March 31st. So go to indeed.com slash conversations to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. That's indeed.com slash conversations. Terms and conditions apply. So um, I, saw, I saw Glenn Greenwald actually uh, post a link to a Pew poll from last year, which asked people whether they supported more censorship from the government of misinformation and more censorship from big tech. 
And it looked at the time trend, like how, how this question has changed since 2018, right? And it's just, you know, Republicans supporting censorship less from big tech, Democrats supporting it more. And it's, you know, it's something like a, you know, a 70% rate of support from Democrats and like a 30% rate of support for censorship from, from Republicans. So at this moment, that has become more and more of, of a partisan issue. You know, we are, <laughs> at the same time, the right is, is very focused on, you know, banning books from public libraries in, in schools and, you know, getting certain books out of the curriculum at schools. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that too. And just like the, the disclaimer here, I know from talking about this on Twitter that someone's immediate response is going to be, if you're against banning books, you're okay with my five-year-old seeing books with, you know, guys giving each other blowjobs in their um, school library. No, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about um, like sexually explicit imagery that a child is not uh, at all ready for. I'm, I'm against that in a very common sense way. I'm talking about, um, you know, the, you know, people on the right trying to get a book like, you know, Ibram Kendi's How to Be a Race, a Anti-Racist out of their public school library. Um, or, you know, I, I know of at least one case that seems to come from people on the left in, in Burbank, uh, uh, California, trying to get uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and, um, you know, like Huck Finn and Of Mice and Men banned, um, partly because, because of some sort of strange, trendy, woke ideas about the white savior being bad and like racism isn't just in the past. But it does seem the majority of this stuff is coming from the right at, at this moment. So what do you have to say about, you know, getting books banned from libraries, banned from curriculums and, and that kind of soft censorship? Well, I'm against it. I think it's very short-sighted. Uh, the Republicans, um, it, it's, a, it's interesting because the, they've spent the last two or three years railing against Internet cen censorship. And they've scored a lot of points doing that. And then they turn right around at the state level and they they do essentially the same thing, um, you know, by trying to ban books. You know, as you mentioned the Ibram Kendi book. Just removing that book from the library is just stupid. Uh, it all it, not only is there a Streisand effect there where you're going to call attention to it and people are going to re read it more. Um, but, you know, as you I think you pointed out there's the internet. I mean, people are going to find it anyway. Uh, and that's a different question from deciding what's in the curriculum. You have to decide what's in the right. curriculum. That's what school boards exist to do. And sometimes they make decisions that are unpopular. And, and I, I feel a little bit differently about that than I do about removing something entirely from, you know, a school system or a library. Um, you know, that's, that's a slightly different question. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the reason I don't spend as much time talking about those local banning issues is because I just don't think they're as dangerous as the as the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube um, banning situations, because those are on a scale that is you know so much more massive. Um, and you know, just politically, it's just much more dangerous. If the if the Republicans uh, had the ability to lean on Facebook and, you know, Google and, and Twitter in the same way that, um, that the Democratic Party establishment is able to right now, uh, yeah, I'd be railing against it in the same way. I just think that I just think that 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 new frontier of censorship is is something that, um, you know, we should be really, really frightened by. We've, we've, we've been there before with local book bannings uh communities tend to rise up against those they don't really go that far and they tend to be localized problems this this other thing is new and serious i think and i think it's it's also you know ironically part of my argument for why taking a book out of the school library doesn't work is precisely this point you're making that there's a huge influence difference between what goes on on the internet and what books are in your school your kids school library right they're going to encounter it on the internet 
because that's the main source of, of, of culture and information. Um, so, you know, what I'm saying is getting it out of the library is ineffective, but it does hand a, a very good optics and PR victory to a person like Kendi, um, who can then say on the internet where your kid is likely to see it, they're banning this book from your school. I, I you know, doesn't that make you more interested in reading it kind of a thing? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, so I want to talk about one, uh, you know, one of, I think, the, the most egregious examples of censorship of an idea from the past two years, which is the hypothesis, hypothesis that COVID-19 leaked from uh, the lab in Wuhan. So this is something I've been, you know, I don't think I've ever actually talked publicly about what I think about that and, mm. until right now, but... Um, the more and more I, I, I read about it, the more clear it becomes that I think it's the likely alternative. It's more likely than not that it did leak from a lab. And obviously this was, you know, if you tweeted this at one point, it would get removed. Or if you put this on Facebook at minimum, it would get flagged as misinformation and removed. And um, now, you know, now it's viewed as a credible hypothesis and it's no longer uh, flagged as, as misinformation. Um, but I'm curious, what is your take on this? Like if you were, uh, if you had to put money on it, do you believe the wet market theory or the, the lab leak theory? Um, well, it's difficult because I, I feel like I lack a little bit of the technical understanding to, to really sift through some of the arguments, which are about the genetics of the virus. Um, you know, how credible are the people who are saying that, you know, X piece of evidence indicates that it, it can have occurred in the wild. That's something I'd have to do a little bit of work on before I, before I had an opinion. What I will say is that from a reporting standpoint, it was deeply suspicious early that everybody was so sure um, that it couldn't have been uh, come from a lab uh, because, you know, uh, as you know, in, in in journalism, we know nothing, right? None of us are experts in any of this stuff. And when we get these stories, um, at best, you know, we're, we're trying to hit a moving target uh, early. This is our best guess about what's happening, but we can't rule out these five things, right? You know, these are some of the possibilities. And right from the start, um, and I put, we, we did a mashup of this on my site just this week, you know, there was this overwhelming emphasis on telling everybody that it was a conspiracy theory. It was impossible. Then there was the you know, Facebook made the announcement that it was going to take down people who suggested that the, the virus did not have a natural origin. And now we're seeing these emails back and forth, you know, between the Eco Alliance and people like Fauci and some of these other scientists. Now, those I do understand, uh, even if I don't necessarily grasp the the technical aspects of it clearly what's going on in those emails is a real fear of a pr problem which isn't by itself proof of anything but it certainly lends credibility to the notion that it's a, it was they thought it was possible right uh early on so you, we we can't say that that if that these officials thought it was impossible at that time because they were clearly considering it um so, you know, that that makes it a, you know, at, at least one of the front runners to be true uh, at this point. And and th- and this to me is the major argument for why you can't have censorship, because somebody has to be doing the deciding uh, about what people will uh, will and will not see. And sometimes those people are wrong and other times those people are conflicted and wrong, which is what is going on in this case, potentially. Uh, And the only defense against that is to let people hypothesize and and theorize and investigate and do all those things. Um, So I I, I think this is a this is a tremendously uh, sort of important story. both in terms of the history of the pandemic, but also in terms of our attitude towards speech. Um, You know, our, our, if they were to shut this down completely uh, and make it impossible for us to talk about this, um, 
you know, that that would put us in a, in a in a completely new political realm that we've never we haven't been in since you know, World War II or World War One. You know, we've we've never had that kind of speech control over this important issue before. So, um, yeah, I, I I think this is a really wor- worrisome one. Yeah. So I, I want to give my audience some of my thinking behind why I think it's it's the more it's more likely that it came from a lab. And just like you, I have no expertise in, in virology, so. This, you know, th- there is a separate question of whether what the virus looks like could only have been man-made. Um, and I have genuinely no opinion on that. I, I can't have an opinion on, you know, I know nothing about like furin cleavage sites and whatever right. that, that kind of thing is. But there are a lot of facts that are no longer disputed that are not, these are not substack facts. These are, you know, Washington Post facts that um, that, that make it, I think, much more plausible than the alternative. I mean, so one is that, you know, Fauci and, and Collins were at the helm of, do, of, of supporting and funding gain-of-function research, which is basically we're going to get scientists to make viruses more transmissible and more deadly in the lab so that we can prepare ourselves for future pandemics that might feature such viruses, right? It's just so amazing that they do that. But anyway, go ahead. So, and this was completely new. This was a new idea. We hadn't, we weren't doing this in the nineties and and the two thousands. It was really Collins and Fauci directly that, you know, I don't know whose idea it was exactly, but they were at the helm of making this a reality. And in I think 2011, I'm probably going to post the the Washington Post article uh, in the description here so people can read this for themselves. But in 2011, they have two labs now. They funded two labs through the NIH and the the NIAID, one in Wisconsin and and one in the Netherlands, where scientists are hard at work making the flu more deadly, right? And, And this was controversial. They published a paper about it and you know, people in some people in the, in the in the White House and the scientific community were worried about the safety protocols. You know, long story short, Fauci and you know they set up an oversight committee to to put a veto, you know, a veto check on whether Francis and, and Francis Collins and Fauci can fund new projects. By 2015 or so, they have managed to basically defang the veto committee fully so that now they have, they once again have full autonomy to fund new gain of function projects. And, um, you know, they write in the Washington post earlier that about why they support gain of function research, why it's crucial. And, you know, by 2015, they've, they've partnered with eco eco health Alliance Mm -hmm. to, to fund the Wuhan lab, which is, working on gain of function research with coronaviruses starting in something like 2015. Um, I mean, like the, everything I'm saying right here is, is not, is not disputed. And, and so imagine, you know, if it had, if it did come from the Wuhan lab, there would just be such a direct link between the, the, the advocacy and funding of Fauci and Collins. Um, and, and that result, I mean, so like, obviously, you know, previous SARS outbreaks have occurred naturally. So that that's very much possible, but roll the clock back to 2011 and imagine if a highly, an, a, 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 you know, an unusually transmissible version of the flu, an un, unusually deadly version of the flu sprang out of Madison, Wisconsin, right? There would be no debate. It, it would instantly be the you know, common sense and the scientific consensus that it came from the lab, quite likely, given that there are only two places in the world making the flus more, more light, uh, more deadly. So, I mean, it would be an enormous coincidence, I think, if this came out of the wet market. And I'm certainly aware of one Oxford study, which said that there were actually no bats or pangolins sold at the Wuhan wet market um, from 2017 to 2019. So there, right. are, there are certainly no affirmative reasons to believe the wet market theory. There, there's been no evidence provided for that thesis. 
And so, I mean, that's a little bit of color on why I think it's, it's more likely. And those are, those are all perfectly logical reasons. And there, there are also reasons why you can't use the words like debunked when you talk about the lab leak. Until you have an affirmative, affirmative proof that it came from a wet, wet market or, elite, or you know exactly uh, you know, who the original host was um, or how that, that transmission took place, you can't rule out anything. And they did. And that was suspicious. And all those other things you're talking about are exactly right. I mean, and they've lied about it repeatedly, which makes it worse. Um, now, I'm going to sound a little bit like a hypocrite on this because I, the, the Trump people also lied about the Russia story, but that wasn't necessarily proof that it was true. Uh, but this is a little different. I think, I think, I think what you're saying in, uh, in combination with the sudden sort of official reversals on the admissibility of this topic uh, as, you know, uh, a possibility um, yeah, that all suggests that they, they take it seriously, that they think that there's no way to deny it anymore. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it, it, it's, if it's not the leading candidate, it's certainly very, very, um, you know, very, very plausible. Yeah. So, and uh, just, I'm just remembering some other facts that also militate in this direction. One is at least according to this, this Washington post article, I think it's called a science in the darkness. Um, there have been three, three virus leaks on the Asian continent since the SARS outbreak in, in 2003. There's mm. been one in Singapore, one in Beijing, and um, one in Taiwan, I think, right? So we know it's possible for labs in countries with highly developed science to leak viruses, right? It's, it's whatever's going on, we have not figured out anything close to a method of completely preventing this and, you know, preventing human error here. We know it's happened many times in my lifetime. Well, think about Marburg, right? I mean, you know, that happened in, in, you know, in several sites in Europe. So. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it's a, it's just like, it's totally possible. There's nothing, nothing in principle preventing it. And, and we now I think have actual email evidence of, when you know when Fauci first called a meeting about this in you know, late January 2020, sort of before most of us in America had really registered that the virus was a, a thing for us too, he you know called a meeting of virologists, and many of them, you know, two or three of them, seemed to think it was at least a 50-50 toss-up based on their looking at the genome. And you know, at least one or two of them said this genome is more consistent with being man-made or man-altered. And, you know, and that was suppressed immediately because Fauci and Collins didn't want to be, presumably did not want to be the people who funded over, objection, over objections from, from many other people, the people who funded more or less directly the lab that leaked a virus that changed the world. I mean, that 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 would involve such a, a massive concession to their reputations. Um, so I mean, you put all that together, it just it's it's insane that this was flagged as misinformation for so long. And as you say, it's just another a great example of why censorship is why big tech companies are not and and quote fact checkers even are are really not uh, to be fully trusted, to be given power, to be given credence. Yeah, and I, I did a, a story last year um, about, and it wasn't really that big of a story, but it was about the dispute between Brett Weinstein and, and YouTube, and I don't want to take a position on who was right or wrong in, in that whole thing, but what was interesting about it was um, when I talked to YouTube uh, about their criteria for what constituted misinformation, they flat out told me that their guidelines were, were constructed in consultation with the FDA, the CIA, CDC, and the NIH. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
this is where you have a problem. If you have big tech censorship, if you have a, you know, monopoly or an oligopoly of information over information and their, um, and their guidelines are coming from, uh, government authorities that may be conflicted in these matters, you, you, you that's a serious problem. I mean, if you imagine if the, the, the Pentagon um, had been, you know, the arbiter of what is true and what is not true after the Iraq war, how long would it have taken for us to find out that there were no WMDs in, in Iraq? It probably would have taken even longer than it did, although uh, they were pretty successful just relying upon the natural incuriosity of, of reporters at that time. But um but still, that's that's the danger of, of this 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 kind of censorship is that uh, somebody always has to do it. And those somebodies can be conflicted. Yeah. So um, you're writing a new book right now on profiteering during the covid pandemic. Can you give us a little sense of what motivated you to write that book and what it's about? Sure. Um and I, I, I think what's happened in the last couple of years, I've fallen victim to this. Uh, you know, a lot of this culture war stuff is uh, it's really interesting and um, it, it's it's fun to talk about. It gets a lot of um, heat on the Internet and all that. But the big story of the last couple of years, really, to me, when you think about it, has been the way in which this disaster has exacerbated the wealth divide in this country. Um, and, you know, we've seen yet another massive transfer of wealth from sort of ordinary people to billionaires. Again, this is something that I saw after 2008, uh, the bailouts have a tendency because the, the way we do bailouts in this country is basically to pour money into the financial sector and kind of hope it works its way, its way down to the rest of the country. But it doesn't really work that way. What, hap- what ends up happening is it gets gobbled up um, by people who know uh, how to manipulate the financial system. And that's what we've seen in the last two years. Uh, from the moment that Trump signed the CARES Act in March of 2020, the stock market went way up. Banks had their best year ever. They had record underwriting years, uh, over $100 billion in profits, both in uh, in 2020 and 2021. Um, private equity companies last year took over a uh, trillion dollars in companies. Uh, billionaires have seen their net worth go up $2 trillion just in the last two years. So it's gone from like 3.1 trillion to 5.1 trillion in less than two years. The, the reality is basically that in in a bailout economy where where the Fed is spending four or five trillion dollars pouring it into the financial system. If you own financial assets, you're going to get richer. If you if you don't, um, you're going to get you're going to lose. And uh, I think a lot of people don't understand how that mechanism works. Uh, so the my idea with this book is basically to go sector by sector and explain, well, how, how did private equity do so well in the last two years? How did banks do so well? How did defense companies do so well? Um, which they did, by the way, they, they were given special dispensation. They were given advances on all their contracts, uh, which they immediately poured into stock buybacks so that executives could turn it into compensation for themselves. Um, so, you, you know, pharmaceutical companies obviously are making a fortune. And Pfizer did $82 billion in profits last year. So um, this is the kind of work I really like to do, which is sort of in the weeds investigative reporting about how each, each of these um, sectors made money in the last two years while everybody else didn't uh, and uh, and how that works. And and because I, th- I think the, the big cultural story since Trump happened is people have this vague sense that the, there was a rigged game that are being ripped off, but they don't know exactly how. And so this, this is what I'm trying to do is sort of speak directly to that. Yes, it is kind of a rigged game, but not maybe not in the way that, you know, some people are talking about. Well, I'd love to have you back on when that's finished. I 
I would love to come back on. Matt Taibbi, so thanks so much for your time. Paul, thanks so much. Appreciate it. If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, colemanhughes.org, and to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll never miss my new content. As always, thanks for your support.